year already trying to predict the end of the world. He's missed it twice. I, I heard somebody say he's kind of gone into hiding right now. He may show up again. I don't know. If you don't want to listen to him, you can always talk about these people that say, well, the Mayan calendar is going to cause us to the world to end next year sometime. December, I think it is. So we have people who predict the end of the world. And we rightly say that these people don't know what they're talking about. The Bible makes it very clear that we do not know the time of the end. It also makes it clear that there will be no signs of that event, uh, uh, as many people want to produce here, that it's the signs of the end of the world. But make no mistake, while we may not know the time, and there may not be a single sign to point to us, the fact is, there is coming an end to this world that we live in. There is coming a day when all of us will stand before God and give account for the life that we have lived. Now, if there are no consequences to our actions, then we could do anything we wanted. The problem with that is there would also be no rewards for those that did good. These people pushed away the authority of Jesus. They pushed away the truth of the gospel. They pushed away the very idea of, of law and, and morality. They pushed away the idea of judgment. Let's talk about Peter's response for just a moment. As I mentioned, the word righteousness or some form of it is a key word in the book of 2 Peter. The, book, the word godliness or some form of it is also a key word. The word holy is a key word. All of those concepts, godliness, righteousness, holiness, that's something Peter was trying to get across. He mentions it over and over and over and over again. Uh, there is, uh, let's see, 25 occurrences. That's an average of once every two and a half verses. And one of those words is found. That's a lot in that little short book. <coughs> what is Peter trying to get, get us to understand? First of all, he tells us that the promises of God ought to lead us to a godly life. The word promise is a key thought in the book. He talks a lot about how God has made promises to us and how he keeps those promises. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, according as his divine power hath given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. He has given us exceeding great and precious promises. Now you could probably take the next year of your pulpit time, preachers, and preach on the great and precious promises of God, and not exhaust them. God has been good to us. And the Christian religion is based upon the fact that God made promises to us and we can trust Him to keep His promises. I always like the passage over in Romans chapter 4 there where he talks about Abraham. Where he says there starting in verse 20, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that what He had promised, He was able also to when you talk about the faith of Abraham, you need to understand that it's not merely a faith in God's existence or a faith in God's uh, omnipotent power or his, or his great wisdom. All of that was there. But ultimately, it is because God made promises and Abraham knew that God kept his promises. That's what motivated Abraham. And it's what ought to motivate us. God keeps His Word. In chapter 3, He tells us that uh, these people were, were challenging that. Where is the promise of His coming? And He tells us in verse 8, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I'm going uh, to focus my eyes here. Give me just a second. 
God keeps his word. But there were other promises being made. The false teachers were also making promises. While they promised them liberty, we saw a moment ago, they themselves are the servants of corruption. You see, they made promises they couldn't deliver on. They couldn't keep their word. God keeps his word. If you will listen to God and follow his directions, he said, you need never worry that God cannot do what he's promised or will not do what he's promised. God keeps his word. Number two, a knowledge of God ought to lead us, lead us to a godly life. God's word has been put forth. And Peter says, you've heard it. You've been taught. You've learned the things of the gospel. And I'm writing now to bring them back to your remembrance. You know what you ought to do. You know what God has told you. Don't let people twist your mind and your thinking down a different path, but you stick with what you know. Throughout this book, he talks about the gnosis and the epinosis, if you will, uh, of knowledge. Those two words can sometimes be used interchangeably, but to, uh, when there is a distinction made, as Peter seems to, to make a little distinction uh, in this book, it's talking here about knowledge gained through study and research, and then knowledge gained through experience. And Peter says, you know from what you were taught, and you know from what you have experienced yourself of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why would you want anything else than that? <clears throat> Number three, the testimony of the prophets and the apostles ought to lead to a godly life. He talks about the transfiguration and he talks about how they were on the holy mount. When I read that, the first thing that came to my mind was uh, Moses back on the, uh, on the mountain there with the burning bush and God's telling him to take his shoes off because you're standing on holy ground. And I got to looking all through the prophets. There was this continual reference there to God bringing his kingdom to the holy mountain. And so there's an emphasis that there's something holy about what Jesus has done. When Jesus came and his glory was shown there on the Mount of Transfiguration, Peter says that made that a holy mount. And then he says a little bit farther down in chapter 1 that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. And then in chapter 2, verse 21, he says that we have received a holy commandment. In other words, everything about the process that brought us this work has been holy. So, if holy men of God spoke through the power of the Holy Spirit and gave us a holy commandment, then what kind of life ought that to produce? A holy life. Number four, examples of history ought to lead us to a godly life. Chapter two there, he talks about the angels that fell. He talks about, uh, no, he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah. There's a particular statement made there about Lot and how Lot was vexing himself, you remember there, in the unrighteousness. Back in 1 Corinthians, there were some people who were asking Paul, what would be wrong with us going down to the idol temple? We know where those are not real idols, and, and we understand all that. What would be wrong with us just going down and fellowshipping with our friends and enjoying the, the, the uh, activities going on there? Paul lists a number of reasons, but he comes down in chapter 10 to telling them, you need to flee fornication. And the idea is, if you go back down there and you're around it all the time, look at what it's going to do to your life. That's exactly what happens with Lot. And it's what happens with so many people today. You cannot be around this without it inf infecting your life. And look at the consequences. God has punished those who led this ungodly life. Number five, the excesses of the false teachers ought to lead us to a godly life. I wish I had time to go through these Greek words. I don't 
but I encourage you to read them in the manuscript there. Basically, what he's telling us as you describe, read the description in chapter 2 of these false teachers is that they were selfish, they were self-indulgent, and their sin was becoming worse and worse and worse 